That's my cue then. Okay. Um, I think we can maybe give it one more minute to, to wait. I know uh, we have a couple of, um, we're dealing with time zone issues uh, per usual, but um, I just want to take a moment to uh, thank everybody for, you know, if you've come in and out throughout the day, that's, uh, that's awesome. Um, we're going to be starting panel three, play communities and practices very soon. Um, and actually Clayton, <laughs> thanks. Clayton, you're uh, up first. So if you want to start getting um, any slides or anything that you have together, um, feel free. Excellent, can do. Thank you for the, thank you for the warning. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> So um, yeah, so Clayton, uh, so our first panel, sorry, uh, is Critical Roles, Learning and Empowering Anti-Othering and Anti-Oppression in the Dungeons and Dragons Creators Community. Um, and that will be presented by uh, Clayton Whittle. Clayton Whittle is a researcher whose work is at the crossroads of social advocacy, educational psychology, and game design. Uh, he has 10 years of classroom experience, has published multiple indie and educational games, and is currently a PhD candidate uh, at Penn State's Learning, Design, and Technology program. Clayton, if you want to go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, you, thank you for the introduction. Uh, all right. Let me, oh, no, my camera's gone crazy. There we go. All right. Let me go ahead and get our slides started. And that should be working. Perfect. Um, I will go ahead with the assumption that it's working. So if, if it's if it's a train wreck, someone just let me know if the slides suddenly freak out. It looks beautiful. Perfect. That's good. It's all black and white, like like I like it. All right. Uh, so today I, I'm going to be talking about probably a very familiar concept, but one that I believe is evolving based on my research and honestly my personal experience since I'm kind of an ethnographer at heart. Uh, I'll be talking about anti-othering and anti-oppression in the D&D creator community. And before I get too deep into the weeds, uh, I wanna give kind of an overarching idea of what I mean by the D&D creator community and what I mean by anti-othering and anti-oppression because kind of no nothing else that'll make sense or nothing else that I'll say will make sense if we don't have a shared definition there. And so the first thing I want to say is that when I talk about the D&D creator community, uh, I, I know it's a huge community um, that, and the RPG community in general is large and spread over and sort of cellular. Uh, but when I'm referring into it today, uh, and I'll kind of inappropriately use the words interchangeably, I'm mostly talking about the group of people who publish on the Dungeon Masters Guild website that is hosted by Wizards of the Coast. So when I say D&D creator community, that's who I'm talking about. And that can be art artists, editors, writers, uh, people who just do PDF layout, but anyone in that space that's making something that they then publish uh, to the world via DMs Guild. And when I talk about anti-othering and anti-oppression, I think there, there's a lot of uh, space for interpretation. And I think everyone will walk away with their own meaning of what it what anti-othering and anti-oppression entails and what it encompasses but in this space when i'm talking about anti-othering and anti-oppression i'm talking about people taking a stand to empower the voices uh, and to create welcoming communities for demographics that are and have been underrepresented or sometimes even explicitly dismissed from the RPG writing space and the Dungeons and Dragons space. And those groups can include, but are certainly not limited to, uh, people who have uh, physical disabilities, people who are of color, people who are non-binary in their gender identity, uh, women, uh, people who have, uh, or who are LGBTQ, uh, 
there are any any number of groups that have been othered by not only the content of Dungeons and Dragons, but the creator space and the play community over the past 40, 50 years. I don't know what year is it, right? So 50 years. Uh, so I just want to get that shared definition out of the way before we get too deep into the woods. And I want to tell you all a story in five chapters. And like any good D&D story, it has a setting and it has some rules and some characters, and then there is a, a resolution, and hopefully the adventure continues. And for us, that's going to be the setting of the study, uh, the, the sort of methodology behind it, and who I was talking to, and what we kind of collectively discovered, and where that work will lead us in the future. The first piece of our setting, I think, is going to be mostly understood by the audience, and that um, <laughs> we almost all will know D&D, but just as a, a quick run over for those of you who have not played, Dungeons and Dragons is what many would consider the, the very first role-playing game. There might be some argument there, but I think most people would consider it that. One of the first role-playing games uh, in which you take on the, uh, the role of a, a fantasy character who goes out into the world and solves its problems by uh, collectively telling a story with a dungeon master and uh, rolling dice to determine the outcomes and spending three or four hours out of the five you play arguing about rules. Uh, so that's Dungeons and Dragons in a nutshell. And I think we don't need too many, uh, too much uh, discussion there because I think a lot of us have probably played, as, as Mark is saying, it is a, a murder hobo simulator to, to most people or to some players. Uh, and there's been as I think this conference points out, there is uh, evidence of there's been a litany of research in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, even specifically within uh, how we see identity and how narratives in Dungeons and Dragons can create othering or how they can create uh, feelings of isolation. And more specifically, you've got, you've got some wonderful studies in the past five years looking at how uh, the monster manual create is uh, creating misogynistic tones, uh, how RP can lead people to interact with different societal issues when those societal issues are represented within the game, and how people can feel pressured to adhere to gender roles in games. What we are not seeing too much of, and I think this conference is a, a wonderful space in that this is one of the first spaces I see really exploring this, is a critical examination of the, the creator space where people are making the content that, that sends these messages. And that is an emerging trend. And I'm, I'm actually really, really happy to be part of this conference because this has been a trend of the conference. And so what I started out with the question of was, well, now that there is a Dungeon Masters Guild and publication is no longer gate kept by Wizards of the Coast, how have things changed? For those of you who aren't really familiar with the Dungeon Masters Guild, it is, uh, in the shortest terms possible, it's an online marketplace. Wizards of the Coast, the company that owns Dungeons and Dragons as an IP, released the open gaming license, which allows anyone to create any adventure using the D&D rule set. If they want to, those people can give that content away for free anywhere they want. Uh, on Reddit, on Facebook, whatever they want to do. If they want to sell it, they are heavily encouraged to sell it on the Dungeon Masters Guild website. And this is, by most accounts, a really wonderful thing. You have a sudden opening of the floodgates. It used to be that, it used to be that in order to publish, you needed to sort of fit the bill in a lot of ways. And I think this is when we first start seeing, based on interviews with uh, some people that I'll introduce later anonymously, uh, we really start seeing some space where D&D &D opens itself up to a lot more diversity when the Dungeon Masters Guild opens because it introduces anonymity first. You have the sudden, uh, no longer required act uh, of networking with a bunch of people who you might not fit in with. And as many of our classic creators that I spoke to who have been doing this for years and years 
have attested to, that meant fitting in with straight white men in their middle years. And not everyone feels comfortable in those situations and networking and pitching to those groups, going out in public and pitching to those groups at conferences, uh, not conferences, but uh, cons, we'll call them, uh, at cons could be stressful and in and of itself othering. But suddenly, with the advent of the Dungeon Masters Guild, you have a space where anyone can upload, as long as you take the half hour to format your document correctly and and read the licensing agreement, you can put whatever you want up to some extent. And we'll see, we'll talk a little bit later about what isn't allowed and why. But this first, the death of the pitch and the birth of anonymity and this sudden low cost of entry, low barrier of entry, and the low cost of failure was a big thing that changed a lot about how content is being created. Because when they allowed anyone to make at the, at the low cost of taking five minutes to upload a document, it removed the barriers, the financial and social barriers of publication, which meant that we could experiment with new types of content. We could experiment with new uh, narratives, narratives that challenged the classic dungeon crawling murder hobo stereotype, narratives that challenged gender identities, narratives that, that challenged racial identities and racial themes in Dungeons and Dragons, things that Wizards of the Coast, no matter what their opinions are, probably were not willing to often uh, risk blowback on by sinking uh, time and money into publishing official content. This unofficial content space has opened up so much, even by existing. Around this space, and this is where my my research really hones in is what we call new affinity spaces. And this is more of an, an education uh, terminology. It's not really game studies, but uh, it's actually been, it's been applied to a lot of games works. Uh, affinity spaces are these ideas of uh, groups like us who want to spend time talking about practicing or learning a skill that we're interested in. And there's litany of research about how these informal spaces form and how they're different from what we call communities of practice, which are much more professional communities where people uh, sit down, make money. They have a much more formal structure. You've got mentor groups. You've got formal training. What the Dungeon Masters Guild has led to in many ways is something of a new affinity space that is takes pieces of each of these spaces and moves to moves to a conversation that goes uh, both ways. Because the barrier of entry is so low, you see anti-othering appearing because new, new creators and old creators share the same space, the same uh, authority structure, and they're split down the middle by what you might call uh, a demographic gap. And that you have, you have an old group of creators who, who have found themselves fitting into, not 100%, but overarching, fitting into the stereotype of straight white males, and a new group of creators who challenge those normal identities and the stereotypes of what it means. And not only do they challenge the stereotypes of what it means to be a D&D player or D&D creator, their new voices are creating absolutely new, uh, new approaches to how we write D&D and how we play d and I'm gonna skip some of this stuff real fast because not skip, but go very quickly. But the study that I've actually gone through is I, I spoke with about six, uh, six interviewees in depth. Uh, I spoke with a lot more people on lesser extent, but in depth, I spoke with about six people and we embarked on a creative project together and we published this project together. Uh, and during the course of creating this project, we had a lot of conversations around the process, how people felt about their voice, their power or lack thereof uh, within the group and within the creation space as a whole. Um, and what we saw was three major groups come up. You have the old guard, the first creators of D&D on the DMs Guild, uh, 
made almost completely of straight white males, almost completely, not entirely. Uh, and these made the, the Dungeon Masters Guild a financially viable and culturally acceptable space uh, on which to, to publish. And for a long time, they had significant power in this space because they, there were only a small number of them and Wizards of the Coast had no choice other than to really listen to them. Uh, after this first round of people quit, or not quit their creation, but moved on or slowed down in creating, you had a rise of new voices. And I've chosen this term new voices, but I think in retrospect, it's not necessarily new. And I think these people, people who do not fit the mold of what the stereotype says is a Dungeons and Dragons player, they have always had a voice and they should have always had a voice. But the Dungeons Masters Guild has given that voice official publication. It has given that voice uh, amplification that it ha has not existed before. And because of that, what you're seeing is a value of new style of play and a new style of content. It's pushing the boundaries of play, no longer square by square, uh, square by square dungeon crawling, checking for traps every 10 feet. Instead, we're seeing narrative structures that challenge challenge um, what we could consider high fantasy. We're seeing critical narrative structures. We're seeing gender narrative structures. We're seeing anti-capitalist narrative structures. We're also seeing a large amount of content that explicitly, even beyond the content of the, of the, the module itself, challenges the through challenges these ideas through art uh, or by character, character design and mechanics, hoping to bring gender, uh, morality, ethics, and critical frameworks into the play. I know I've only got two minutes left, and so I'll go through these findings sadly very quickly. I know I get a little long-winded. Um, so you have two major groups of findings. And these groups of findings, these are critical in my mind because I think I, I did not find what I wanted to find. And that's always sad when you're looking into something and you have to accept that you're not finding what you wanted. I was hoping to find a structure of empowerment because the DM Guild on the outside is a structure of empowerment for other voices, explicitly and implicitly. And you have movements from the old guard, the original writers, things like intentionally only hiring other creators, publicly supporting those, me those messages. You have initiatives from these new voices, including uh, sensitivity consulting, in which uh, a member of a community can consult on messaging within a publication referring to that community. Uh, you have creation of other content, like I've been talking about, and you have Wizards of the Coast and the community writ large maintaining a much more inclusive space and calling out non-inclusive messages and paladining, as some people call it, those messages. What you also have, and I wish I had more time to really get into this, but what you also have is conflict and disempowerment. And that comes from both sides uh, and from the old guards perspective and the new voices perspective. There are a lot of changes happening in what it means to create d and And a lot of people who feel they have rights to, to what should be published are losing those, their voice. And many of them are happy to do so. I've spoken with uh, creators who have been doing this for decades, who have been publishing professionally. Uh, for decades, and some who have only been publishing for five or six years, who explicitly go out of their way to make other voices empowered and to seek out other voices to see overview their own content. But those old guard are also feeling a pressure of a community that tends to dogpile and thrash out messages that don't align with its value system. And I think a quote from a quote from the old guard that sums up a lot of their feelings is that you need both paladins and rogues. The paladins go out into the world and they tell us how we're supposed to live and they show us the right way to do things. 
But if you only have paladins in the world, what you have is everyone dogpiling on everyone who has a different idea or a different message. And so from their perspective, we have a, a, a community which is, which is engaged in some explicit anti-othering, which has led to a, everyone's voice counts except for this voice. The new voices perspectives have also experienced a lot of toxic disempowerment. And this was the part that I was really hoping not to find. But within public spaces and private spaces, and even official lines, there is still significant othering uh, of, of these non-traditional voices or non, I guess we could call it non-traditional content, if that's, if that's what we want to call it, which I'm not even sure I'm comfortable with that word, but content that doesn't come adhere to uh, the homogenous D&D content of old days. Uh, and you're seeing, and I think I've, I've gone over on time. So yeah, I'm a little bit, I'm sorry. We have to I'm sorry. But this, that's okay. Um, we'll have lots of good conversation more in the in the Q&A and we can maybe ask, have you like uh, continue what you wanted, the, some of uh, the future uh, in that. Um, and there's some really great conversation happening in the chat. I just want to be mindful and respectful of the yeah. other panelists. Yeah, sorry about that. Thank, thank you so much for having in. <laughs> no, absolutely. Okay. Um, so um yes excellent so next up uh we have uh sam sam tobin and ian williams talking um uh, about old hammer uh and the craft and memory of old hammer uh so um sam and ian if you wanted to get i'm not sure who's presenting yeah okay <laughs> if you want to go ahead and get your um slides all together um and then we can proceed and ian's gonna be running the slides so uh, yeah okay. i'm gonna run the slides i'm gonna switch off because we practiced so hopefully it goes off without a hitch um, how smart of you <laughs> right. it's the only smart thing we're doing <laughs> yeah let me uh share screen and uh we'll make certain that this uh pops up okay all right are we looking good beautiful Okay, awesome. I'm going to take just one sec so that way I can move and clear. Okay, so first of all, I want to thank everybody for being here. It's a lot of people. I wasn't expecting like over 100. Um, my name is Ian Williams. I'm a third year PhD student in the Department of Communication at UNC Chapel Hill. And I'm uh, co-presenting with my co-author and friend, Dr. Samuel Tobin, who's an associate professor of communications media at Fitchburg State University. Um, we're here today to present some work we've done examining Old Hammer. And Old Hammer, just very briefly to start, is a craft and gaming community based around what is basically Old Warhammer. Um, that doesn't really quite articulate why we find it interesting and why we hope that you find it interesting and important. Um, retro gaming is pretty well trodden, get, trodden ground, but we think that there are a couple things that are kind of unique about Old Hammer, and we're going to get into those. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to start with a brief dive into the history of Games Workshop. You're probably familiar with Games Workshop, but on the odd chance that you're not, they're the makers of Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000. So they make miniatures war games. And at the very least, you've probably seen one of their Space Marine miniatures in a meme or something online. Um, so they made Warhammer and then they made Warhammer 40K. And in the process, they end up becoming incredibly successful, easily the largest war games company in the world. And they eventually go public in 1994, uh, where that success is just compounded uh, to the present day. Um, the success was built on uh, the back of a particular style and ethos. Uh, the designers and sculptors were universally punks and metalheads who were brought up on 2000 AD, Judge Dredd, kind of new wave of British science fiction stuff. And they aimed for an irreverent satirical vibe back in the 1980s with lots of puns. There was a distrust of Margaret Thatcher. They turned orcs from racial caricatures into caricatures of uh, football hooligans, um, stuff like that. Now, what's really important for our purposes is that Games Workshop changes an awful lot as it grows, right? That punk ethos wears off, the satire is blunted or disappears entirely, but it's not just the vague immaterial stuff like vibes, which we can point to as a change. Games Workshop's material output changes drastically and noticeably over the years. In the 1980s, Games Workshop's miniatures, for instance, were hand sculpted, right? Like they were actually carved um, from like a master mold, and then they were put into mass production in letter pewter. This yielded to plastic miniatures, which are more efficient at scale, 
Um, and now they're exclusively plastic with a few resin pieces here and there. And they're designed with the aid of CAD, which is computer assisted design. So basically they just, they design it in a computer and then ship it off to be produced. Which fine, big deal, right? Except the material practices of using miniatures as a consumer and player from assembly to painting to playing to displaying them are different now than they used to be. This isn't just a matter of the rules being different now to different playstyle preferences. This means, I, I literally mean that like paint behaves differently on metal than it does on plastic. For instance, you have to varnish metal due to chipping while you don't really have to do that with plastic. The paint flows differently. The brushes are different. So Old Hammer, returning back to the topic of the paper, is a community based on reproducing the material practices of the Warhammer hobby prior to when these corporate changes occurred. And we want to stress, and we go into this in a little bit more detail in our actual paper, that exactly where that inflection point of change, where it is, it's contested within the community. But the community agrees that it's no later than that 1994 moment where they went corporate, where they went public. So in the simplest terms, Old Hammer is about this, and these are like some old space marines on the left and some uh, old 1980s ghosts on the right, and these are made out of metal. So it's about this turning into this. These are 2021 versions of the same miniatures. They're lither, uh, they're made of plastic. You can see, particularly with the ghosts, there are these spindly points of connection between miniature and base, which are very fragile. So it's a very different, um, it's a very, very different design ethos, and even the painting is different. Um, so what you end up with is you end up with hundreds or maybe even thousands of old hammers who meet up on uh, who meet up online in online communities on Facebook and elsewhere and in person at conventions like one called Bring Out Your Lead, which is their biggest one and has a really awesome name, um, to create this community with various standards of material practice based on this bygone era. But, uh, but we've observed this for several years and we've even like participated in this, but particularly closely over the past year. And one of the, there, there are a couple of curious things which come up, which is what we're going to get into in the rest of this presentation. The first is that this isn't particularly reactionary, like you might expect. There are elements of that, certainly, but it's not like certain big corners of, for instance, the OSR movement in the role-playing game space. There aren't a whole lot of arguments in these spaces uh, about gatekeeping women and minorities. Rather, there's this really, um, really explicit recognition that the past isn't coming back. It can't, like, like Games Workshop can't suddenly go non-corporate. It can't suddenly in, uh, uh, show up again in 2021. And they don't really want it to. Rather, um, that's, that's a very different type of nostalgia and reckoning with the past than you often see in the game space uh, broadly construed. The other is that they're constantly refining and applying standards of craft, which don't really register legibly to those without a grounding in what they're looking at. So I chose this picture of a really poorly painted old space marine on the left and a nicely painted current space marine on the right, because there sincerely are old hammers who will s insist on the left being better by some interior criteria, which isn't really obvious to the rest of us, even if they would say that uh, that one on the left needs a touch up after 30 years. So we're going to explore these two points of examination a bit more, and I'm going to turn it over to Sam. Thank you. Uh, so in this section, I'm going to try to cover a little bit more of the theoretical framework that we're using. We already saw some of this in the last slide. Only now do I see that that's redundant, but um, <laughs> we're gonna be uh, paying close attention to material practices, issues of memory and nostalgia. And to do that, we've been drawing on um, Boehm's reflective nostalgia as opposed to her restorative nostalgia, uh, Fisher's concept of ontology, uh, crosses uh, tools for talking about consumption, popular culture, and nostalgia, and uh, Stewart's uh, work on the miniature, um, specifically her use uh, of the concept of memory. Um, just more generally, though, um, uh, we're still paying attention to the voices of Old Hammer. Um, old Hammer is, uh, according to, to uh, one Old Hammer, finding what is good and interesting in the past and returning it to the present. Uh, and it's, it's, it's this. Uh, somewhat optimistic uh, charge that we're taking up here. Um, and this is, is uh, fits really well with Boehm's concept of, of, of reflective nostalgia. Um, it's one that um, uh, isn't about going home. It's, it's deferring homecoming, which is a central component of nostalgia traditionally. And uh, rather it's about uh, sort of savoring uh, the details of, of, of the past uh, and about space and temporality. Um, given the wide ranging changes that Ian just outlined, and as he made clear, old hammers can't go back, right? And we, we, we think they know that. Um, uh, so the 
question isn't one of restoration, but of reflection. And how do they do this reflection, right? Um, it, it, they do this uh, with bodies and memory work. Uh, so here using bodies in, um, to talk about remembering, you'll excuse this sort of hyphen theory, um, but it's, we are remembering bodies, right? And in this sense, it's, it's the body of the, the hobbyist um, at, at their work table, perhaps in their basement, um, but it's also the body of the figure of the miniature, right? And um, we're gonna get more into this in a little bit, but um, uh, on, the, on the human side, uh, the, the body um, is used uh, to, to reproduce to the, some actions that, that are associated with this time period, specific techniques, as Ian said, the material demands different techniques. We'll come back to this with craft in a bit. And all of these are resonant with Paul Connerton's concept of incorporating practices as a kind of memory work, which uses the bodies of the participants as opposed to other objects to memorialize, commemorate, and revisit the past. Uh, and, um, this memory work is, 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 is material in this sort of crass sense at the table, but it's also complicated, right? It's, it's um, solitary as we see, but it's collaborative through online discourse. Um, it's ahistorical yet antiquarian, it's networked yet corporeal, even carnal in Louis Quacon's sense. Um, and a lot of this is um, uh, helped if we think about Susan Stewart's treatment of nostalgia, um, which comes down to issues of size, right? Um, the miniature and the gigantic. Uh, and so size, objects, desire, nostalgia are useful for conceptualizing the miniature as a memory object. Um, and that we do, that we return to the time of the production or the creation of these miniature objects um, by holding and touching them uh, is key. And this is something we take from Stuart. We can contrast this with another scale of the gigantic, right? So one way to think about these miniatures, the militarist miniatures, is that they're a lot like statues, albeit tiny. Um, and Boehm uses the figure of the statue, the kind of civic military statue, uh, particularly in Eastern European context, but as we've seen here in the US and others as well, uh, as, as reactionary. Um, they, uh, they loom, they take up space, they uh, dominate. Um, and they're, they're permanent, right? They're fixed. Uh, but we'd like to have reversed that, right? So what happens when it's small, even if it's of a similar image in some ways, even if it's of a futuristic fascist super soldier, um, we actually think that uh, a completely different order of politics comes out of that. Um, with their tactile proportions and assumed positions of observation, uh, they demand reflection, not veneration or submission. Um, uh, Old hammer miniature statues, uh, unlike the giant statues of the town square, um, invite introspection in their handling. Uh, we are meant to move them around the table, to arrange them on our shelves, um, and, and they, they are meant to move, even though they are static, and in moving them, um, they move us, right? There's an emotional aspect to this. Uh, I wanna quickly just, we definitely don't have time to go into everybody who's done work on miniatures and on wargaming, but there's some particularly useful um, uh, recent work um, by uh, Mary Lennon, um, Stenros, and Hilyaka, um, uh, which in some ways is resonant with Carter, Gibbs, and Harop's uh, earlier work, um, all of which suggests that like Old Hammer, where well, they're talking about Games Workshop in general, contemporary Warhammer, Warhammer 40,000 holds true with Old Hammer. It's not just one thing. Ian and I have been talking about painting and modeling and to some degree collecting a lot, but it's also playing, it's thinking, it's writing, it's talking, right? That, that there's no central um, point here. Um, we return to the material aspect. And yes, these are all different kinds of materiality but the sort of um, almost vulgar material aspect of the miniature, because it's a useful framing device, but it also seems to us to be the linchpin on which everything rests. Um, and these miniatures are produced both by the designers, but also by uh, us who paint them or convert them or model them uh, through craft. And uh, craft, and here we're, we're taking this from Senate, um, is, even if it, the instantiation of the, uh, the, the tool hitting the material might be solitary, is intensely social, right? And it's, it's a social practice. So it's good we're on this panel. Um, one which is um, 
obscure to outsiders who aren't um, trained or don't know about uh, the standards and hierarchies that come with craft um, and, and as well as the values and, way, and ways of making judgment, right? And, and so when, when uh, we see the, uh, uh, let's say charming old space marine compared to the cleaner, sharper um, uh, new version, um, what we're seeing is a kind of split that comes out of a craft community. That is an understanding of a split that comes out of this craft community. Um, practically speaking, a lot of this comes down to in discourse in Old Hammer, but also in Senate to CAD, that is to computer uh, assisted design as being a kind of um, split between a tendency towards the perfect um, or the potential of the perfect and um, uh, a kind of uh, a lovable trace of the hand of, uh, of the imperfect. Um, uh, Ian's gonna detail this more now. Uh, before we wrap up. Yeah, thanks, Sam. So uh, sociality, memory, craft, politics, uh, that's that's big stuff. So I chose this particular image because it's a perfect example of how tightly linked craft and the social are. So this is an image from White Dwarf magazine from the late 1980s. And White Dwarf is Games Workshop's in-house magazine. It's been going on for, it's been running for a long time. Um, and it comes up on the Old Hammer Facebook group every six months or so. I've seen it pop up three times now, and there's always a discussion about it. Um, it's of somebody's army, and it's not really at all well painted compared to other White Dwarf armies. So you probably can't pick up a pick up on it fully in your screens, but there aren't any highlights on the miniatures. They're not even washed. And for reference, washes are very thin paints that you slather on a miniature to like run into the recesses and give some depth. Old hammers love this page, and I've never seen any of them say anything otherwise. Um, they say consistently two things. The first one is that they use words like honesty, that, these, that this is an honest paint job, which is weirdly enough a word that Senate also uses. Honesty in Senetian term, terms awakens the object through craft. Two, they like the achievability of it. They see that and they know that they can do it, even as there's a recognition that you have to know what it is you're looking at to even know that you could achieve it. And that's really important, right? Because in other words, it means that they know that they can achieve it, which is not the same thing as you being able to achieve it because they've created those standards of good, acceptable, honest, and so forth and so on. And that achievement is linked to this particular time and the methods which, methods which went along with it. So Mark Fisher, um, who's always been in vogue for about the past 10 years for his, for his use of Derrida's hauntology when it comes to pop culture, um, that means that he, he theorizes that we're haunted by lost futures which never arrive, right? And that keeps getting picked up in terms of things like synthwave and music and movies uh, constantly being remade, right? But one of the things which I think is overlooked about Fisher's usage of hauntology, and this is something I've noticed that Jeremy Gilbert does a really good job of bringing back into focus, is that it's not just the repetition or the nostalgia for one's childhood. It's about the death of social democracy and the lost futures which disappeared with that. In other words, old hammerers, they wouldn't articulate it like this, but there's a recognition that once upon a time, this craft that they love and participated in, it could have gone a very different way. And they want to return to that and see and explore those lost futures, right? Um, and not, crucially, not every old hammer is a 40 something year old dude shelling out cash for lead from his childhood, right? There are 20 year olds, there are women, there are um, uh, people of color in these communities. Um, who have no personal, particularly with the, uh, the age thing, they don't have a personal memory of classic Warhammer, and in many cases, even of the slow and winding of the welfare state. And that's heady stuff. And again, like old hammers wouldn't parse it that way, but we all swim in culture. And the awareness of the contortions of those years is articulated through our embodied material practices. One of the really interesting things about the history of Games Workshop, and it's why we led with it, is that it maps very neatly to the advent and dominance of neoliberalism. So the 1990s cemented neoliberalism as a bipartisan global project. And to see a group of anti-Thatcher game designers in leather and Judas Priest t-shirts become corporatized throughout the 1990s with global supply chains at their beck and call all of a sudden and implications with the carbon extraction industries, to see that reflected in the materials with which you craft and the words that you read and the games that you play, well, that's a really neat mapping to the shifts in the broader culture. And old hammers are aware of that chronology. I'm going to let Sam take us home here. This is not to suggest that the revolution will be uh, launched with lead and super glue. And we share a general wariness, um, like Megan Morris has gone over, about um, ascribing revolutionary possibilities to any popular culture fandom. Um, and old hammer in itself is not revolutionary. 
but Old Hammer is a kind of awareness of a possibility of alterity, of loss, of a time when another less grim dark future was possible. Old Hammer does this through craft and memory work and through material practices, which are themselves a mode of critique. Forget nothing, forgive no one. Thank you. Thank you so much. And per usual, there's the chat is blowing up and there's lots of questions to be had. So, um, but we will continue on um, with our next presentation uh, by Greg um, Loring Albright and Wes Willison. Uh, and they will be talking about memorable artifacts, the co-production of unique materiality via game rules. Um, and Greg Loring Albright, uh, studies non-digital games as a PhD candidate in Drexel's University's Communication, Culture, and Media program. He also has uh, practical working experience in board game design. He's the co-designer of the third edition of Block by Block and recently signed a game to Minnesota Publishing Leader Games. Uh, he's designed live action and puzzle games for various colleges, museums, and parks, and his ongoing dissertation research focuses on um, tabletop games and their digital adaptions as media environments. And Wes Willison um, recently finished his uh, uh, Master's of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary uh, and works at the intersections of faith, place, and making. I love that. So welcome, Greg and Wes. And I'm not sure which of you is going to... I any... will share our slides. Okay. Thanks so much for the intro, yeah, Shelly. Thanks, Shelly. Absolutely. And yes, we can see that. That's beautiful. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much to the, the previous presenters and apologies for my looking this way. My second screen's over here. I'm gonna start a timer and then I will start us off. Um, so, not even on the right slide. This is uh, Memorable Artifacts, the co-production of unique materiality via game rules. And uh, the sort of core of this talk is about keepsake games. We're gonna dig into what that term means, but this is an example of uh, two Keepsake Games, Field Guide to Memory. The background picture is from Field Guide to Memory. And this inset is from Amending, a keepsake game that involves sewing. So already you can see materials are very important. Um, we're gonna look into a, what is a keepsake game? Sorry. <laughs> so uh, si since, you know, presumably, I haven't actually done the research on this, since D&D came out, there were, I assume, countercultures and modifications and new ways of playing. And these trends of modifying and changing and naming parts of TTRPG culture have been ongoing. So this term keepsake games is a part of that tradition alongside things like lyric games, powered by the apocalypse, belonging outside belonging, forged in the dark, et cetera. Not necessarily all systems, but all terminological approaches to role-playing games. Um, number two, while permanently altering materials is not a new phenomenon, these games explicitly lean into their materials in such uh, aggressive, for lack of a better term, ways that, that this centering of the material is worth noting. And then thirdly, keepsake games were sort of uh, published and theorized during lockdowns connected to the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is a phenomenon of its time. We're going to now talk about keepsake games as defined by their designers, both uh, Xing Yin Kuo and Ji Yan Shim. Uh, recently, uh, Diana Jones Emerging Game Design Award winner Ji Yan Shim, I think was announced to this morning, um, co-designed a field guide to memory, and then they posted on their Patreons some, some thoughts on this form and what it means. So I'm going to read this quote from Xing Yin Kuo. In order to engage with a keepsake game, the player must modify an original artifact or begin a new artifact creation process as a part of gameplay to produce a unique object that is the result of a collaboration between the designer and player. So we have a formal concern here. Jian Shim in her post says something similar, uh, I, I elided it, but then she goes on to say, keepsake games are also statements against disposability culture. By imbuing their artifacts with all the meaning of their game experience, our hope is that the thing that makes them precious also makes them enduring, treasured, and kept, the opposite of loneliness. So uh, Shim here in this quote is presenting a thematic approach. And there are a few more thematics that Jian Shim says that they kept yeah, sort of at front of mind while they were making a field guide to memory and that they theorize as being part of what makes a keepsake game a keepsake game. 
So uh, we thought about uh, those things, those formal definitions by uh, Xing and Core, and we thought about the thematic constraints laid out by Jian Shim, and we thought about some other games that had those things, and we said, are those keepsake games? Um, and uh, uh, later in her post, Xing and Core says, a game that contains physical artifacts as tokens or even central game mechanisms, but which are unmodifiable or otherwise not physically adapted by the player is not a keepsake game. A toy, no matter how lovely or playable, is not inherently a keepsake game. So we have this bounding function here. But all of these things fit within the boundary. We've got uh, on, the, on the left here, thousand year old vampire. Uh, up top is a character sheet for a tabletop role playing game called Fate. I'm sure you all are aware of it. We've got a system, uh, The Quiet Year, in play. This picture is from Shut Up and Sit Down's review of The Quiet Year. And then we have Pandemic Legacy Season 2. All of these games make gestures towards keepsakeness. And we were interested in interrogating whether or not they were sort of keepsake games avant la lettre, whether they were something else entirely, and what that would mean. So uh, we decided to investigate it for ourselves. And now I'm going to turn it over to Wes. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, so for method, um, we, we focused on autoethnographies. Games have formal properties that suit themselves to autoethnographic research, we've found. Uh, their situation of play is instantiated by materials. That's our focus, right? But it transcends mere materiality. Um, Paul Booth writes, uh, the game itself as a mutable, textual, tangible object does not come into being without the addition of player agency. Um, so while games exist as physical or digital entities, um, it's not instantiated until it's played. So that's what we're focusing on. Media, uh, next slide, please. Media or object or um, textual analyses of games reveal formal properties, right? That's top level. Ethnographic observations of games in play can reveal uh, important aspects of that moment. Um, but autoethnography and or interview methodologies allow access to uh, deeper data. Um, the feelings experienced by players, um, or even by us as authors, as players. Um, so if games writ large are well suited to autoethnographic approaches, keepsake games are particularly well suited to this method. Um, these games are personal, right? They ask players to bring something of themselves into the game. So as such, uh, personal and reflexive methods are required in order to fully grasp what a keepsake game is doing. Um, the temptation as academics is to hold it at arm's length. It's not possible with these games. Uh, keepsake games are, at least so far, typically solo games, played alone, um, even if in concert with others via social media. So as such, even an observation of the game in play wouldn't reveal much, um, even to the most dedicated observer. Uh, so an account of the internality of the player is necessary to study the games. So in crafting our autoethnographies for this project, um, we're really indebted to He Wong Chang's autoethnography as method, um, text that sort of explains how, how this approach is, is practicable to novel practic novice practitioners like Greg and I. Um, uh, she writes that the autoethnography that I promote in this book combines cultural analysis and interpretation with narrative details. Um, so it's that synthesis that we're doing, right? It's not just telling your story, it's, it's providing these themes and other thematic analyses simultaneously. All right, next slide, Greg. Um, so let's talk about my experience of playing Pandemic Legacy season two. So as you can probably tell, if you're familiar with Pandemic Legacy, this isn't a keepsake game, avant la lettre, as, as Greg likes to say. Um, but uh, pandemics, as we now know, uh, exhibit properties of what, if, what some have called hyper objects um, so these are unitary phenomena that are vastly larger than an individual human's capacities to grasp, okay? Pandemic legacy obviously attempts to render a hyper object like a pandemic as not only graspable, but playable. Um, unlike a sandbox style toy, for example, a box of Lego, pandemic legacy does not present the player with a collection of objects that bear pandemic-like qualities uh, and just inviting the player to just explore at will. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. Uh, grappling with the overwhelming scale of pandemic was, has been, is a daily emotional and intellectual drain. And so um, the strict rails that the game provides for the experience to roll along um, was a strange comfort, actually. We played this game starting in last March, March of 2020, moving into April and even into May. 
And so we were pivoting away from incessantly just ref refreshing our news feeds, um, looking at updated case caseloads uh, to play this. And this was refreshingly accessible and even reductionist compared to the complexity of the world around us. Um, and it gave us time, gave us space, gave us materials to reflect on this hyper object at a more human scale. Um, and pandemics are not playful. <laughs> They're not contexts that tolerate mistakes or recklessness uh, that, that's deadly. So to have this opportunity in the game gave us a bit more space, um, gave us something like a diorama or a simulacrum of this hyper object with a low penalty for experimentation. Of course, uh, the artifacts of a pandemic are contextually compelling, but they don't encode their own stories, right? We know these objects intimately now, right? Masks, hand sanitizer bottles, Clorox wipes, maybe ticket stubs from canceled concerts. Um, by comparison, the artifacts of pandemic legacy encode their narrative that progressed and developed on the card. You can see on my character cards, sort of on the right of your screen there, um, a game board with altered land masses, like we see here. Uh, this tells a story by looking at it, right? As I look at these cards, I remember the experience of going through this gameplay. Um, and so as we watched the ongoing unfolding of the pandemic around the globe, eroding and as we eroded and destroyed our microcosm of that global event, uh, that was emotionally resonant. It was appropriate. We felt sadness, we felt grief, we felt anger. And these are not pleasant feelings. Um, and so as we progressed through the game, I felt reluctant to continue playing. Uh, as the caseloads climbed in China and Italy, and then in the US as well, the prospect of revisiting that loss and destruction in the game was repulsive uh, or even scary. Not because our actions had any real world consequences, but because the emotions were so intense, they were unsavory. And playing Pandemic Legacy thus felt like something to be worked through, uh, similar to how I show up for therapy, even when I don't want to. Uh, so this is ultimately how I recognize keepsake elements of Pandemic Legacy, uh, which wasn't designed as a keepsake game as such. I was personally involved and it, in the material choices of adding scars to particular character cards or adding markers indicating the growing caseload around the world, I felt myself invested not in the, just the game's global context, but in my own murky interpretation of my own global context. So go ahead, Greg. Thanks, Wes. Um, so I'm going to now present a little bit of uh, data from my autoethnographic notes while playing Field Guide to Memory. Um, Field Guide to Memory is a journaling game. Uh, the primary physical object is a journal. As you can see in my photo here, it started out pretty chill. And by the end of the game, it sort of exploded with objects and drawings and napkins and things. Um, this, this is the keepsake of the keepsake game. Um, most of the time I played field guide in the early to mid afternoon while my one year old, some of you saw him briefly a second ago, took his second nap of the day. I would play at my standing desk where I am now, pull the journal down from the bookshelf to my right, open the game PDF on my laptop and read the day's prompt. Then I would print any ephemera before undertaking the journaling aspect. There's not a lot of surface area, so I tend to take the notebook inserts and taped in bits and all into my left hand and hold it open with my thumb scrolling with my right hand like some sort of poetry teacher in a cheesy movie. Uh, so that was my experience of playing this game. It was repetitive. It's a daily practice. And it's, um, I didn't like that. Uh, I found myself reflecting on my thoughts that uh, having to do it every day, I compared it at times to uh, devotional, the evangelical Christian practice of reading the Bible every day, which was a part of my childhood and which I didn't like then and, and don't like now. I, I compared it to homework, which is not a uh, as bad considering I'm in academia, but was still not playing a game. Um, I see we're running a little short on time, so I'm gonna cut short some of my observations. But basically, I sort of, this game rubbed me the wrong way a little bit in terms of its daily repetitive nature. By the end, uh, I was into it. I have some, some positive, a lot of positive feelings that I've kind of brought up, but I was surprised that this repetitive daily task, which I thought would feel good, would feel meditative, uh, didn't feel good to me. So. That was, that was an interesting finding. Um, the last thing I wrote in my, my notes during my autoethnographic practice was playing today, this was the last day of the game, felt very good. I wrote a letter to a person from my past, used the press leaves from day four in really thoughtful ways and transitioned out of the game space, preventing bleed as LARPers call it. My heart is full and I'm carrying a warm memory with me for the rest of the day. So uh, I wish I could say more about playing this game, but we have to get to our theory section. How much time we got, Greg? <laughs> 
we have two and a half minutes left. Okay, so very basically, we postulate these two poles as ways of understanding what keepsake games, how to position them contextually. Um, closed games uh, are, are, are worlds where the, the rules are presented, strong rule set, um, and you have to follow rails, right? So pandemic is a great example of closed. Open would be like a box of Lego, right? You're just presented something that um, doesn't imply a set of rules or ways of interacting. And the other pole is indelible and repeatable. Indelible being, you know, it's marked or it's formed or it takes a shape that cannot be reformed or readdressed. And repeatable, of course, is um, a box of Lego is a great example. You can always take it apart and, and just replay it. Any, any, most board games sit in that repeatable space. So we've, we've filled it out with a few games that we're, um, we find exhibit these qualities. Uh, Keepsake Games and Pandemic Legacy are interesting because they're on this indelible side, right? Um, there's a sort of third pole or a third category that we really think a lot about, which is this, this dynamic between um, personal and generic, right? So how much of your personal context are you bringing into the game? Um, and keepsake games are dramatically attentive to this. This is very important to them. Pandemic is not. Pandemic legacy for me was purely because of the context in which I played it. Um, so we think that of that sort of as a shadow pole. Um, so yeah, we, we think keepsake games are irrevocably indelible, right? And that's what originally drew us this project. Uh, these formats invite creators to engage the interior, the personal, the emotional, or even spiritual dimensions of the players, not by means of a particularly delicate rule set, uh, but by interaction with the material in front of them. Hopefully these categories prevent meaningful rails for future game makers and scholars. Greg, take us home. Good, I'm muted. Thanks to everyone uh, for your time and attention. Uh, we still have a lot of theorizing we're doing. We drew on a lot of literature that we didn't mention by name, because as you can see, we're already short on time. But if you want to chat with us about any of these ideas, tell us ideas that came up or uh, uh, say, oh, you should you should cite this person. Uh, please send it our way. We'll be in the Discord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I need to unmute myself. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's only been, you know, a year and a half of doing Zoom things. It was bound for somebody to, to talk while, while muted. And of course, it had to be me. Okay, so our last but not least, um, thank you so much, Greg, Greg and Wes. And there were lots of conversations happening in the chat that we will get to um, after Emma's presentation. Um, so Emma uh, Kostopoulos is here to present werewolves, superheroes, and bad dates, teaching the fundamentals of rhetoric and argument through social de deduction games. I absolutely love that title. Uh, and Emma, sorry, I printed it out like an old curmudgeon. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, and, sorry. Emma is an assistant professor at uh, Valdosta State University where she works at the intersection of writing studies game-based learning and digital and multimedia rhetorics. When not teaching, she writes a lot of lot of words for a lot of different places. Take it away, Emma, thank you so much. Hello everyone, first of all, can everyone hear me okay? All right, awesome. I'm so sorry about hopping in late and about this, you know, odd kind of, I just got done with my first day of new faculty orientation today. So I am here right now, just ran home and got right on my computer so you can see my my like green screen kind of off in the corner there because I didn't even have time to set that up. Um, and uh, and again, thank you very much to the conference presenters for this because uh, I was originally slated to present in a different uh, panel, but that ended up not working out because of my orientation schedule that I didn't get until very late. Um, so this is kind of a uh, very quick rundown of this sort of very big broad idea uh, that I just had. Um, and I have kind of a visual um, that I think might not be super useful because it's still very rough. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of talk you through some of my ideas. Um, but to, to start off, um, there's, there's this idea, there's this internet uh, kind of argument or question that's been going around for the past couple of years that you might be familiar with. And it's the question, is a hot dog a sandwich? 
And what this question does, right, is it's silly, it's ludicrous, but what it does is it gets people to take these stances in this, you know, kind of low stakes, ultimately, like, does it, you know, do governments rise and fall on the fact that a hot dog is a sandwich or a taco, as I'm seeing in chat, right? Already, already there's this discourse, which is great, because you're proving my point that for not everyone, but for a lot of people, the process of forming arguments and taking them to their logical conclusion and defending them can be this sort of fun, interesting, playful experience, right? Arguing can be fun. Um, and so that is kind of my big idea uh, that I'm still kind of currently fomenting my way through is that there are these genres of games, uh, particularly one called social deduction games, right? Like werewolf, uh, mafia, games like that, right? That all deal with the players forming arguments and then those arguments being sort of used as sort of both the tent pole for, you know, how well you're playing the game and whether you achieve a win state or a lose state. And so, my big idea in a sentence is social deduction games and games based in argument can play a valuable role in helping to teach rhetorical awareness and persuasion in the writing classroom, right? Even judging by the fact that taco, hot dog, sandwich, handheld lunch food discourse is still happening in the chat, right? Indicates that these types of things and these questions can be really compelling and they're already kind of present in our game spaces and in our writing and argument spaces. And so that's my big idea, is that these games can be really helpful in, teach, in helping teach parts of the writing classroom because the goals are already pretty similar because the goal of a social deduction game is to make your case and persuade your audience, right? Whether that is through earnest persuasion or through you know, subterfuge and deceit. And the goal of a writing classroom is to be able to harness your own rhetorical flexibility and the tools of language in order to make a case. But I'm not actually going to spend a whole ton of time defending this claim as this claim, right? Defending it as, yes, these things are useful. Because what feels far more interesting to me is talking about the ways in which we can use these things in the classroom and how we can implement them and how we can make them work for different types of students. Because, you know, arguing things like beginning to ask the big bulky questions like, is this fun? Is this even a game? Is this educational? Those things all feel way too huge to tackle in the span of like 10, 15 minutes, right? So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my big idea to be true with some small you know, justifications that these games exist and are played by many people. So there's, you know, clearly some sort of fun or people get fun and engagement out of these ideas. And that these games share an explicit goal with writing classrooms, which I already stated. So if these two things are true, it makes kind of an intuitive sense that we can pick these things up and use them in the writing and English classroom. And so this idea is still kind of a theoretical egg it hasn't necessarily like hatched into a qualitative study chicken yet um, because, you know, one of the things that you that happen when you switch institutions is not only do you have to navigate like new IRB, but you briefly lose institutional library database access. So that's been kind of stymieing me this summer. Um, but all right. So the two types of games that I'm going to be talking about here are first social deduction games, which are a game where players attempt to discern each other's hidden roles or allegiances. So examples of these are like werewolf or mafia, right, where players are assigned roles by kind of a powerful, you know, sort of game master, and then the players must figure out between themselves who is playing what role. Um, and then there's another type of game that I haven't found a whole lot of literature on. And so I kind of came up with a term, but perhaps some more experienced people in the realm of game studies uh, know that these games already have kind of a term, but I like to think of them in the realm of writing studies as Socratic dialogue games, 
or a game where players are given positions to defend. And the winner of the game is the one who achieves the highest level of agreement or consensus from all players and bystanders. So examples of this are uh, games from a company uh, like Super Fight and Red Flag, right? Yeah, debate games. Yeah, um, I think I think debate is perhaps you know I've seen that term around and I think that it it works, but debate is so loaded in you know my particular discipline of uh, of rhetoric and composition, and specifically because Socratic dialogue is something that we do so frequently in the sense of sort of asking these questions, right? And sort of forcing, you know, each other in the classroom to sort of defend and pick nuance out of our arguments. So, uh, so things like super fight, red flags from a particular company, um, or with some modifications and with, you know, heavy caveats for content, you could easily turn something like apples to apples, or I would never use this uh, game as it currently exists with its regular content in a freshman classroom, because that feels very fraught, but games like Cards Against Humanity. Um, so those are kind of the two types of games that I'm thinking about. Um, and this is something that hasn't, to my knowledge, been talked about a whole lot within the specific sphere of the writing classroom, because games in the writing classroom have been I'm not saying no work has been done, but a lot of the prominent work on games in the writing classroom has been heavily theorized through the sphere of the digital and through using games to compose. So uh, a lot of the work that uh, one of my mentors, Rebecca Schultz Colby does is she uses World of Warcraft to get students to write things like game guides and you know other rhetorically savvy genres. But we aren't thinking a whole lot about how we can use extant games that employ some of the same uh, that employ some of the same techniques or that require some of the same skills, right? Um, because rather than sort of retrofitting a game and saying, you know, okay, here's how we can sort of alter or break or hack the game, right? It seems like these games almost come kind of ready-made to be used in a writing classroom. Again, not saying that hacking a game can also be super benefit because it's super beneficial because it absolutely can. But I just think there's a really easy entry point here in particularly of these games. And yes, Sarah Lovett, I love Sarah Lovett. Um, <laughs> she and I are good friends. Um, but yeah, so I'm, see I'm seeing lots of like, uh, Rebecca Schultz Colby and Sarah Lovett Love, which is good because they're lovely people and you should love them. Um, so, but some things that I think we need to think about in terms of these, um, in terms of these games is overall fundamentally an issue of access, right? This was something that I really, really had to think about when I was doing things like my dissertation, which dealt with role play in the writing classroom. Um, and, you know, even sort of thinking beyond, you know, uh, these specific games, using play in the classroom at all has this kind of key element of public performance, right? In order to play a game with your classmates, your classmates have to see you play. Your classmates have to, you know, be aware of what you're doing. You have to call attention to yourself in some way. And this can be a really sort of isolating or alienating experience for students who are maybe not confident with either the act of play or they're not confident with their skills in the classroom. And uh, moving kind of, you know, narrowing focus into that is that a lot of these games, particularly, you know, social deduction and Socratic dialogue, use impromptu speech as a key element of how to play is that you have to sort of come up with arguments on the fly and then someone rebuts and then you have to rebut them. And it's, you know, we often think of it as this very fast paced thing, but that can actually be really inaccessible for a lot of people because, you know, there are students who might need accommodations or students who simply prefer time to think out more nuanced um, and thoughtful responses, right? They need that time to compose. And so really one of the biggest problems with putting these games in a classroom environment is creating an environment that is at once thoughtful and dynamic. These things aren't 
they aren't opposed in any in any way, but some of the easiest routes to being thoughtful can lead to kind of a static or sedentary classroom, and some of the easiest routes to being dynamic can lead to a very kind of fast-paced classroom where it's easy for students to slip through the cracks. And so what I would, what I've kind of done here is I've divided the writing classroom into uh, sort of two quick goals that I'm going to go over really quickly. Um, first, a goal of the writing classroom is to recognize the rhetoric that goes on around you. Um, and so we often do things like rhetorical analysis, right? I mean, you know, if you've gone to uh, if you've been in a college writing classroom in the past several years, you've probably analyzed ads and things like that for their rhetoric. Um, and so what these games do is they acknowledge that all the communication in play needs to be strategic and that gets students consciously analyzing the actions of their peers, right? They aren't uncritically accepting the things that their peers say because they know that their peers have this goal. They're thinking consciously about the goals of communication, which is leading them to think about the tools and the way the communication is being presented. And so from there, it's very easy. Thank you so much um, for that for that timer. Um, from there, it's very easy to move from these very explicit rhetorical acts, right, into getting students to think about communication where the rhetorical moves might be more tacit or more implied, right? That's why we start with ads so often is because you know that an ad is trying to get you to buy things. Same thing with this game. We know the goal is attempting to get is attempting to win, is attempting to persuade people to get people on your side. Um, and so what I kind of have been thinking of as a potential solution to these, uh, to these issues is to make sure that you give all the prompts both verbally and in writing. And instead of uh, doing instantaneous response have short time, have short timed responses, right? Where you say, okay, so you have a few minutes to compose your response and you can write down your thoughts and it isn't an instant verbal back and forth volleying. The other goal, use rhetoric to achieve your own goals, right? We don't just want students to be aware of the rhetoric that's happening around them, though that is a goal. We also want them to, to be able to use rhetoric to achieve their own goals, to communicate for themselves. And so generally the writing classroom moves from analysis to creation. You spend some time analyzing and then you spend some time attempting to create rhetorically savvy documents. But what this game does is it does both things at once. You are simultaneously analyzing the rhetoric of your peers and you're attempting to use rhetoric for yourself. So it really is a hands-on immediate learning experience with very little prior modeling going on. And so what we need to do in these spaces is to prompt reflection about what rhetorical tools were effective in the moment so that students can better retain these things. So obviously again, theory egg, not a qualitative study chicken yet. Uh, and again, you know, this was kind of a presentation that I didn't really know I was going to be able to give until today, but I'm so delighted to have talked to you about all of these ideas. So some of my parting thoughts and rooms for expansion, I like to leave the room with some questions uh, that I still have, is again, this is obviously an imperfect system at this point. So how do we make this space more welcome, welcoming and inviting for students who, you know, are perhaps not super comfortable with this really dynamic, hectic, you know, argument uh, going on in the classroom. And then sort of my second question is, can social deduction or Socratic dialogue, which seems, you know, really so finely tuned to take place in a college writing classroom, find its place beyond the writing classroom? Can it have a place in the disciplines? Can it have a place elsewhere, right? So the students can move these techniques from the writing classroom into like their work in STEM or into their work in business. And then finally, how do we make that transfer? How do we make that transfer of knowledge uh, so that students can retain what they've learned and use it elsewhere? How do we make that apparent to students? How do we make it really clear what we want students to get out of the experience so that they can identify the learning that they've done? All right, that is my presentation. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, 
as a person who teaches two sections of comp every semester, um, I'm very interested to hear more about, what, about, about how you're using this in the classroom. Um, so we still have about 15 minutes for Q&A time. Uh, and so we have questions for all of our presenters. Um, so for Clayton, yes, Clayton's there, okay. Sorry, there's too many. I have a very tiny screen and, I, and the Q&A part takes up a lot of room for some reason. Um, so Clayton, uh, somebody asked, do you have much insight into how the dynamics you discussed spread out from D&D to, D &D to other RPGs? You focused a lot on the on the Dungeon Masters uh, Guild. Um, are there other um, similar uh, guilds out there for other RPGs? So I have not worked with creator communities in other RPGs. But I have worked with creators within the D&D space who are branching out. And I think the answer to that is probably not one that's going to be very uh, <laughs> encouraging, is that, is that you see a lot of uh, disempowerment of those voices. drive through RPG, someone just posted, that's, that's an excellent one. You see a lot of disempowerment of those voices through official channels. And so some people who are a lot of creators who want to push the envelope of what they're allowed to publish and publish explicitly uh, anti-othering content are finding their way into these other creative spaces. Uh, drive through RPG specifically is a very popular one. So whoever posted that, I didn't see the name, but that's a, it's a great place. Thank you for answering my question. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and then we have a few questions for Sam and Ian. Um, one is very long, so hang on. Um, would you comment on the OSR design movement in relationship to Old Hammer? Uh, are there D&D analogs to mechanics, not to, not the miniatures, perhaps play style? For example, there's an idea of praising discovery in OSO, OSR forums that is compared to collaborative story games, uh, so that a singular play person, the DM, is in charge of creating plot that players discover. Did this relate to your nostalgia as craft, the craft of the facilitator? Um, I'll take first crack and I'll let uh, Sam uh, kind of uh, pick up. So it's interesting. And I think that like there's going to be like a common theme with the other two questions as well, because I've been reading them, which is that like all of that changed. Right. So like the question of scale, for instance, the miniatures are literally bigger than they used to be. Right. They're like on average, I don't know, like six to 10 millimeters, I would bet. Uh, so there's something called scale creep. Um, so this question of the DM is really interesting because in the earliest editions of Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000, they had game masters right so you had somebody who was there crafting a narrative and there was like an rpg element and probably you know for for political economic reasons that was completely shed right like there is no more game master you might have somebody who's like coordinating a tournament or a narrative event kind of like in this meta way but like as far as like having a game master at the table that doesn't happen um it's really also really interesting because sam and i actually debated talking about the role of the game master and eventually we realized we were going to have to do a close reading of like the warhammer 40k rules and that would just take us into you know like sam said when we were writing this paper we could do two things but like probably not three so we probably should just not do this so we did i i i, I just it's okay. I, I totally i totally um agree with you in saying i don't want to take up a lot of time there's lots of great questions here but um in terms of, um, I think one thing that we want to be careful about is that there, there is ways in which you could see Old Hammer as being part of a larger retro looking or backwards looking um, experience that's going on in games and maybe across culture. But we also wanted to point out sort of what's different about it, right? And what's different about Old Hammer possibly than some of the uh, other, let's say OSR for instance, isn't just that OSR is tends to be filled with jerks or anything like that. We're not saying that like people who do old hammer are good. It's not that kind of value judgment. It has to do with the role of miniatures being really, really um, uh, central to the way we experience uh, uh, this, this, this pastime and how that changed, right? That that's, that's what constitutes old hammer is this awareness of, of this sort of loss. Whereas I, I mean, I'm not really involved in OSR, but you know, I'm the right age to be, right? And like, um, there's no loss. You can play any role-playing game you've ever wanted to play now more easily than you ever could before, right? And uh, in, in a way, more people are probably playing like, I mean, just the idea that people use the term like red box now, right? Like 
No one talked about that back in the day. It was just called D&D, right? So it's, it's, it, there's a way in which more people are playing the Red Box now than ever have before, right? Um, whereas with Old Hammer, um, nothing needs to happen. You don't need to go to bring out your lead to do Old Hammer. You don't even really have to paint, right? There's a way in which part of my ongoing interest in, 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 in this topic, I've been trying to work on this for a long time. Thank God Ian came along and did everything, but is that there doesn't seem to be a center to talk about, right? And that's, 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 that makes it sort of always a weird fit for game studies, right? Like if, if we're not talking about a game really, right? We didn't talk about line of sight. We didn't talk about how cover works, right? Um, do we fit here? So one central theme seems to kind of be the, the war, and this is uh, Sarah Lynn Bowman's question is, since, there's, since the there is always war theme of 40K, so total, totalizing, is there less terrain for like, political battles over narrative directions like we see in D&D communities? For example, there's no question about whether or not violence will happen as the setting demands it, so the old guard has less to fight against. I'm going to take that one, Sam, and I'm going to find a link to. Uh, I think that's a, that's a really astute question from Sarah, right? Like, um, I think if we wanted to push the, the the miniature thing, like the old metal ones come with their guns attached to them, right? So there really is no possibility to have a. Um, I mean, I would I would totally play. I'm a thousand year old space vampire blood angel letter writing epistolary game. Like, I might play that tonight, but um, she's absolutely right. Sarah's right. Like, you can't get war out, right? there is only war in, in the far future. And this is true in, in the past as well. I would say you could look at other communities of practice that use Games Workshop miniatures. So you could look at things like Inquisimunda or Inc. 28 is this sort of like home making of small scale investigative skirmishing narrative play that kind of moves out of what a territory Games Workshop is sort of seeded. I know there's Necromunda. But um, as 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 potentially, it's okay. It's still violence. Never mind. Everyone still dies in every game. There's vortex grenades. I mean, how are you going to get away, right? Yeah. The the, the I, only I, thing that I would add, just very quickly, is yeah. that you know, just like everything else, it's about how like what the violence is used for. Like it was used very satirically at first, right? That like not in like a nihilistic way, but that there are things worth fighting for, and those are tamped down in the in, in all this like mass violence until it's finally you know now it's like very tactical. You know, so like you have the Marines who look like you know SWAT cops and stuff like that. So it's just a very different like kind of violence. I'm just going to link something real quick in chat and I'm done. Absolutely. Uh, to switch gears completely, um, for Greg and Wes, uh, we have a couple of, we're talking nothing about, hopefully not about violence, um, and again about that kind of scaling down. Um, the question is, how do things like convention ephemera fit into the keepsake model? For example, your, for example, character sheets from the first ops or paint and take events or LARPs that use player badges to store game information, et cetera. Yeah, thanks, Jack, for that that question. I'm going to take it and then let Wes chime in if he wants. Um, yeah, so we didn't unfortunately have a lot of time to go into our sort of theorization of the borders of keepsake games, but basically the slide where we showed the thousand year old vampire and the character sheet and the quiet year is all about that section of like games that make things or game like you mentioned conventions in your question specifically. Like I think following Jian Shim and Xing Yin Core's definitions convention ephemera wouldn't be keepsakes as produced by a keepsake game because they're not produced by a game proper. Although something like a, like a one-off character sheet or a mini that you painted as a part of playing the game would enter into that sort of boundary territory because it's the game that led you to make the material modifications. Um, and, and we're still sort of theorizing this, but basically I think where we come down is that it's not you can't solely look at the formal. Uh, you have to sort of uh, deny that the author is dead and look at the intent. And that's sort of why collaboration made it into our subtitle. In Shingen Core's definition, she says, the unique object that is the result of a collaboration between the designer and the player. That uh, ultimately, to a certain extent, it's a keepsake game because the designer said it's a keepsake game, which as a game designer isn't a very uh, satisfying place for me to come down, but that's where we got to. <laughs> I don't know, Wes, do you have anything to add? Well, I'm, I'm fascinated by that there's always war question. Um, 
And the idea that some of these ephemera, you know, postulate a world that stands on the game's terms, not on yours. Keepsake games invite you to project your world into the object, right? So a, a corollary game would be like if someone were to make a game about climate change, right? A hyper object that is our present and our future. Um, and this object bears and holds some of the, the imprints of your character construction or the way you play this game. Like that would be a fascinating game to me. It doesn't exist. Now, for if I lived a violent life, if I had a Kevlar vest that I wanted to include into some sort of game format and invest it with, with my manipulations of it, I mean, maybe there is, is something closer to what you know, this this future postulated by the existence of this object, right? And and because keepsake games draw that into the present, right? It's not what I when I played Pandemic Legacy originally, I was like, what a wild concept, a, a pandemic. And then it became keepsake because we live one, right? So that's the context where I think this this there is always war question becomes so significant that the ephemera that you hold at the center of this keepsake game bear in them meaning for the present, for your personal context right now. Um, so that's that's the only thing I would add. Yeah, that's awesome. Wes. That's um, a really well stated uh, way of putting that. Um, and I'm just wondering to kind of bring um, Emma's uh, presentation into this, thinking about um, all, you know, as many of us teach, all of our students are coming from a very different point of view. And I, like, I often make the mistake of making assumptions about what my, what my students have experienced based on what I've experienced, right? Um, and, and I need to remember not to do that, but especially now with, you know, in, with something like the pandemic that might, everybody has a different understanding of it. Everybody lived a different experience of it, right? Some of us have experienced tremendous loss, some of us that has not happened. Um, so I'm kind of wondering how these sort of keepsake games might actually be beneficial in like the writing classroom where trying to get students to talk about that or write about that can be very, challenging and difficult and at the same time you don't want to necessarily trigger them and certainly not trigger them in the classroom in front of everybody but at the same time have an experience that can be meaningful for them that they can take away um, and have something that that's theirs that they can own and not for you know a grade or whatever uh, so I, I know there's not really a question in there but if you want to comment on that please feel free no i think i i, I think there's a lot of uh, really good stuff to comment on uh, there because I mean, you're right in that these experiences when we ask students to like write of themselves or like of their own experiences right there's because you know this is something that you kind of work through is that um, sometimes writing about who you are and your identity and your experiences can be really therapeutic and can be really empowering and it can be really really great for you um, and you can learn and discover and grow through things about yourself but you're right in that it can also be this kind of traumatic thing and so yeah I think that it is really important that when we're thinking about in the classroom and we're having students share their experiences or do you know this thing in creative writing that's kind of called own voice voices at this point where you like write from your own particular experience that um, it's always very important to kind of keep that as separate as one can from the concept of assessment where you know like you don't want to grade someone on the experience but then if you're grading the piece of writing in any fashion there's always going to be a piece of that that's going to feel like their experience is being graded so it's very it's something that I've literally been kind of you know, fussing with in my brain since I started teaching uh, several years ago. And it's something that I don't have a super awesome answer for yet, but it's through, but, you know, but, but maybe, you know, I mean, there's, there, there there's lots of uh, discussion of the therapeutic uses of both writing and play. So, you know, bringing those together, I think in some fashion, but it's just all about, you know, tantamount making sure the student is comfortable and having that buy-in. Yeah, and I just think the the format or the the boundary of the game itself might help with that. That's something that I really need to think a little bit more about. That's a that's a kind of big thing, and I am kind of I do feel kind of like I've missed a lot of really rich discussion, having just kind of hopped in at kind of the the final hour uh, of this presentation because you know I was learning about. Uh, public safety and uh, things at my new university. So um, apologies for that. I'd love to, I'd love to chat more or like think more about it. But I, again, it, it's not even a theory egg at this point. I don't even have the egg yet. <laughs>
So, and and that's okay. That's the, one of the nice things about this conference is it's you know we're it's low stakes. We're all you know kind of just postulating these different ideas and thinking through. And that's been half the fun for me. Honestly, has been participating in the chat and the Discord and just seeing all the different threads and narratives happening. Um, we are just about out of time. Uh, if anybody has one last question, otherwise uh, at 5.30 to 6, we have a break um, for or whatever time it is in your in your area. Uh, and then at 6 o'clock Eastern, um, our second keynote is happening. Um, Elizabeth Hargrave is going to be talking um, and giving her keynote. So with that, I think we will um, adjourn for, for a half hour and then if um, and then resume at six o'clock for, for Elizabeth Hargrave. Thank you again to all of our panelists. This was a wonderful conversation. Love the chat. Keep it going in the Discord if, if folks have questions or want to share resources, um, absolutely. And we will see you all in about a half hour. <laughs>